we'll continue with uh, talking about um, uh, the qualities of people who serve God and we have gone through most of the teaching already and this last two parts for, uh, this part is about ministers attitude toward ministry the ministers attitude toward ministry so how um, how should we you know how should our attitude be so that it's uh, our ministry will be strong now Psalm 139 verses 16 to 17 tell us that God has a wonderful plan in our lives this verse says, uh, says that all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be how precious to me are your thoughts God how vast is the sum of them so God has a wonderful plan for us all written in the book of life in heaven now if he has all the Christians life written in the book of life he would also have all the Christians together that is the church the church he also has a plan he has a plan for our individual lives he also has a plan in our uh, the, the lives of the whole church so what does that uh, imply for us it means that we know that God has a wonderful plan God wants to do things for our life God wants to bless our ministry God wants to give us strength God wants to use us greatly so we can have faith that it's God who wants the ministry it's God who wants the ministry so he'll make sure that the best will happen when we trust in him and obey him but when we don't obey him and don't have a good relationship with him then he cannot work in our lives and cannot bless the church but if we all have a close relationship with him and trust in him then he'll make the plan come true now before we have talked about how to make God's plan come true in individuals life that is when we dedicate our body as a living sacrifice and do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewal renewal of our mind so it's the same for the church if the people in the church dedicate their lives to God and not be trans uh, conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewal of the mind that everyone follows God's plan uh, submit to him then his plan will come true and his plan is always wonderful he has he always has wonderful plans for individuals and for churches so we have confidence in that now I still don't see Washington your group responding to me in WhatsApp please tell me from time to time that you are seeing the uh, the video and hearing the sound uh, is there any problem okay use the Kenya minister online uh, that group okay okay now um, faith in God's power Isaiah 40 31 but those who wait on the Lord shall renew the strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint Philippians and then Philippians 4 13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me now why do I talk about this why do I talk about this the point is I have met I have met Christians who are weak I've met Christians who are weak and who uh, I mean ministers ministers who I'm sorry let me see okay okay good okay now I have met ministers who say that oh I have no strength in my ministry I have some even say I'm burned out I I don't see that God is helping me I see problem in my life and my ministry so today I talk about my, our attitude toward ministry first we believe that God has a wonderful plan so he always wants wants to bless us that's very important to believe that he wants to bless us and he wants to mix make, make the church go higher and higher stronger and stronger now many people don't believe that they think that the church will not go strong but if everyone has a close relationship with God and everyone enjoy God's presence and is strengthened by God then the whole church will grow so I hope that we all believe that God has a wonderful plan and then in Isaiah 40 verse 40 
uh, 31, it says that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So when we wait upon the Lord, when we trust in Him, when we have our eyes on Jesus all the time, then our strength will be renewed and we'll we mount up with wings, wings like eagles that will fly higher and higher and we shall run and do ministry and help people and not be tired and not faint. So this promises that we'll have continual strength. But some people say, I don't have much strength. The reason why they don't have much strength is because they don't have a close relationship with God and they don't trust in God. And they just look at people, they look at the problems of people, then they don't have strength. But if we keep trusting in God, God is helping us. Hallelujah! Whenever God is doing anything, praise God and let the person share what God has done in his life. When people keep sharing what God has done in their lives, then everyone is encouraged and everyone will have strength. So I hope that all of us will, will uh, trust in God for, our, for strength, that we know that He is helping us. And then Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here means that we can do greater things. So the church, when we have the church, first we want to see how is the condition of the church, how is the condition of the people. We want to be realistic and understand the condition of people and then help them grow spiritually, help them to trust in God, help them to have a close relationship with God and bring them uh, closer to God and help them to, to, uh, uh, to be strengthened by God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the motivation to serve God. If everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit and is joyful and wants to glorify God all the time, then the church can go higher and higher. If people go into the church and see that the people in the church are all filled with joy and strength and care about people, then the church will go stronger and stronger. So let us examine our churches. What is happening there? Uh, are there strength, strengths? Are there weaknesses? And what are the causes of the weaknesses? And why are, are some people strong? So let the strength spread to the whole group. And then if there are weaknesses, we want to work on those so that, uh, that uh, everyone will be joyful and care about other people and, and uh, care, care about God and want to worship God and glorify God. And then the church will go, go higher and higher. So I hope that we all have this hope and go and believe that God has a wonderful plan. He'll do great things in the church. And then, um, now it happens a lot because sometimes people, church members, would criticize the ministers. They say they haven't done well enough, the church is not growing. And they would blame the ministers. And then the, the ministers would feel guilty and they feel they are, you know, they, 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 uh, they are criticized by other people and then they can lose strength. And this verse can give us much encouragement. It should be for everyone to believe, to understand this. 1 Corinthians 4 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one, is, one be found faithful. So for stewards, people who serve God, people who, who is a steward of the house of God, who takes care of the house of God, that, that every one of us, or even uh, lay Christians, when we take care of our life, then we should be found faithful. So all Christians, when we are faithful, that is the requirement of God. When we are faithful, then God is very happy. Now, there is room for improvement, but when we're not so great, even when we're not so great, when we are faithful, we can be saying, I'm faithful, I'm working hard on it, I've tried my best, I trust in Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best, then we don't have to blame ourselves. And the church members should not blame the ministers that the church is not growing, but everyone should work together. If the minister says, try his best and trust in God and, and, uh, and serve God with the power of God, nobody should complain that he is faithful already. What is required of the minister is that he's faithful. What is required of the members is that they are faithful. So if we are faithful, we can say, I have tried our best and we can relax and we can say, I'm doing God's will. Now, but there is still room for improvement. Then we can say, well, I, uh, let's find out what are some areas that I can improve. 
what are some areas that I can improve? What are some areas that I, I'm, we are weak, that the church is not growing? Why is it not growing? Then we'll find out and then we work on it. But every step when we do anything right, we say, I've been faithful here. Can we say that? I've been faithful here. Our church has been faithful here. The minister has been faithful here. And then we won't blame anyone. But we'll say we appreciate every person. Every person is now serving God. Hallelujah. So it's very important to take away the guilt and take away the, the sense of weakness that saying that I'm very weak, I, I don't have strength. Okay, another, another thing is many people, they are afraid of Satan. Now Satan is powerful. Satan is powerful. But Satan is not almighty. And Jesus has given us the power over Satan. That's very important. Jesus has given us power over Satan. We have victory over Satan. In Matthew 16, verse 18, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus said to Peter, You are Peter on this rock, because uh, uh, his name means rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gate of darkness, of hell, will not overcome it. So Satan will not overcome the church. The church will always have victory. Even though now there is much persecution, but we still know that God is in control. Now some people say this is just what you think, but what I hope that everyone believes that is God is really in control. He's helping the church. When we trust in God and hold on to God and be faithful, then the church will be stronger, stronger and stronger, even in the midst of persecution. And then in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus has given us the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. This represents the forces of darkness, the, uh, uh, the demons, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So nobody can hurt us. Satan cannot hurt us. So we don't need to be afraid of Satan or the demons. But we need to know that if we give Satan a foothold, then Satan will come in. So we need to realize that uh, foothold to the devil will open the way to attack. But if we trust in God all the time and have faith in Him, and then take care of all the sins. Now, if we have any weaknesses, we immediately say, please, I'm sorry for my sins, please forgive me and wash my sins away. And then God will forgive us. And then we can forget about the sins and keep going forward. And then if we trust, keep trusting in God and have a close relationship and take care of our problems and sins, then Satan has no way to attack us. Then Satan cannot attack us. Uh, now many people, you know, uh, sometimes they give people fear. They say, if you go and cast out demons, Satan can attack you. Now, casting out demons is obeying God. When we obey God, demons have no way to overcome us. Demons have no way to attack us. Only when we sin, then we give Satan a foothold. But when we don't sin and trust, keep trusting in God, Satan has no way to enter. So we don't want to say, Satan is attacking us. But we want to say, if we sin, we open the way to Satan. So pay attention to what we can do. Sometimes people just say, Satan's attacking us now. Then they say, I don't know what happened. You know, they say, we preach a gospel, we build a church, and then, well, things go wrong, and then Satan is attacking us, or we, it's, it's terrible. Then they don't know where the attack comes from, and then they have fear. But instead we can say, if you know, we sin, then we give Satan a foothold, and then Satan can attack us. But if we are sorry for our sins and repent and trust in Jesus, then Satan cannot attack us anymore. Now, but of course, if, for instance, if a church has committed something serious, a serious sin, or a pastor commit a serious sin, it would take a while to take away the attack because people would keep attacking the church and the pastor. So we want to be very careful. Any sin 
doesn't just have a consequence right now, but it has a long-term consequence sometimes. So we want to uh, be sorry for our sins and say no to sins and don't let sins come into us. Any kind of anger, frustration, abuse of the people, uh, uh, the pastors uh, doing things that he should not be doing, or he is forcing the people to do things by force. These are all sins. Sometimes pastors think that, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later, that some pastors think that, well, they should all submit, so whatever I do, they should submit. This is not the biblical teaching. The, the Bible also talks about mutual submission. So when people force other people to submit, they also give the devil a foothold. And we want to have a unity, unity of the church and joy in the church so everyone is relaxed and enjoy and, and enjoy serving God and enjoy the relationship with God. And then everyone has strength. Then we don't have to worry about Satan. So I hope that we don't fear Satan and we don't have to say, oh, today I have a fever. It must be Satan attacking me. We don't have to say that. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, sometimes it could be just physical reason. But, you know, we want to examine our lives. Do we have any, any uh, openings to let Satan attack us? If we don't, we don't have to worry. And we say we have victory. Hallelujah. Okay. And then believing God's word has power. That's very important. You know, nowadays I've seen many preachers, they, they don't expound on the word of God much. They read the word verse and then they explain for a few minutes and then they go on to other things. And a lot of times they're not explaining the verse. We should learn to explain the key words and the, the important concepts in the Bible. You know, I have heard people preach and then they use one verse about anointing and the whole time he, was, he will be talking about anointing is great, anointing is powerful, anointing can do this and do that. And it, it's not talking about the Bible passage. He's just saying anointing, anointing, what can it do, what can it do? We should find out from the Bible what the Bible says and then explain to the people. So people, the, the faith of the people is built on the Word of God. And here the Bible says that the Word of God has power. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. Now this is God speaking. So my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void. It will accomplish its purpose, that it will not come back empty-handed and doing nothing but it will accomplish what God pleases and it will prosper in the thing for which I send it. So we want to read the Bible verses and explain it. Here it says that the Word of God will not return void and it will accomplish the things that God has sent it to, to do and also it will prosper in the things it do. So we train everyone to believe in God's Word, to trust in God's Word and to follow God's Word so that we have strength all the time then the people will be strengthened and the whole church will be strengthened. So when we have faith in God's Word, then we have uh, faith in God's ministry that He's going to do great things. Uh, years ago, I was doing uh, youth ministry in a church. And uh, the, uh, one of the church workers there said, Oh, you, I noticed that you always talk about the Bible. I said, that's where we have strength. Our teaching should be from the Bible because there are many youth workers, they talk about other things. But I always talk about the Bible, talk about God. And then when people hear God's Word and they have faith in God's Word, and then the faith will grow. So for myself, I have full confidence in God's Word and I trust in God's Word. And I always relax in Him. I don't worry about anything because I know everything is in God's hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I hope that everyone would, would uh, have faith in God's Word and uh, memorize the Bible verses and apply it and follow it and then have faith that it will accomplish the great things that God has planned to do. Okay, now it talks about our ministry, what will happen in the future, that God would test it with fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 
Verse 12. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So what it says here is that, um, so when we plant, plant means do evangelism. And he who waters is the one who, who shepherd, who build up the group. So the, the evangelists and then the pastors. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So here it's explained very clearly. Our reward will be according to our labor. What we do, how much we work on it, and then we'll receive the, record, uh, the reward according to the labor. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear because the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort of this. So each person's work will be tested with fire. Now, this is um, a, a figurative language. It's, you know, our good works are not objects. It's gold, silver, precious stone. It's not objects. It's just describing it, using figurative language to describe that some people's good works are good in the sight of God, and then they are like gold, silver, precious stones. Because when we serve God, we're not making jewels. Uh, so this verse is not talking about making jewels. And then people who serve God with the wrong motive, they're not making wood, hay, and straw. But it's talking about the quality of the ministry. Uh, now, this is not just talk about uh, pastors and evangelists. It's talk about everybody. Everybody's good works. Everything we do for God will be tested. And then it will be revealed by fire. The fire is not literal fire, but it's like the testing of God. Now, so what would uh, the good works be if it is gold, silver, and precious stones? It will be something that is pure in the sight of God, that God is pleased with it. And the Bible tells us what is please, pleasing to God. It's according to God's word. It's done in faith, done in love, according to God's way, and follow God's instruction, then it is uh, gold, silver, precious stones. So when people have a heart to please God, to uh, glorify God, and to bless people, then it's gold, silver, and precious stones and their teaching is according to the Bible, then it's gold, silver, and precious stone. But when some people just do it for the reputation, for money, for, for uh, power, for control, for pride to show other people they're doing great, you know, sometimes some leaders might ha have a heart of show off. I want to be greater than all the other pastors. Our church wants to be bigger than any other churches. This heart by itself would can cause the ministry to become wood, hay, and straw. And we want to build up each other. We want to be happy. The other church is growing. We want to pray for them and bless them and pray for our own church. And then when we see people doing good, we praise God for everything they do good. This is good attitude. The attitude is according to God's Word. God's Word is unity and love and care and supporting each other and and uh, praying for the kingdom of God, not just for our own ministry. So, uh, God gave me a picture. We all build on this foundation of Jesus Christ. When people, when people build with the pure motives, then they are building with gold, silver, and precious stones. And then if they are building with wood, straw, and hay with wrong motives, then what they're doing is they build something and then it's torn down. Now, many people try to do evangelism, but they want to show off and see how powerful I am. I can bring so many people to Jesus. And then what they're doing is they are destroying what they have built. And what happened is it will be torn down. They build up and tear down and build up and tear down. Then what they've done is in vain. I think nobody wants to work in vain. If we want to serve God with results, then we want to glorify God and have a heart, a pure heart to bless people, a pure heart of compassion on the people. I want to do good things to people. I want to bless them. I want to help them. I want to glorify God. Then 
God is pleased with us and then He will build up what we do and He's pleased with it and He'll bless us more and more and our, uh, we'll receive reward according to what we do. So I hope that we all have this heart of doing, serving God with a pure motive to glorify God and to bless people and not for our own pride or our own benefit. Okay, now next point is about, uh, this is actually the last point about uh, um, people who serve God. It's about handling failure because we all have failures or difficulties. So it's very important not to have despair in difficulties. In 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So here it talks about we are hard-pressed. Paul was hard-pressed that there was pressure from different directions, but he was not crushed, that he was not defeated. He was not, you know, uh, saying, oh, I'm in failure, I'm, I'm giving up. He's not giving up. And we are perplexed. Now, sometimes we don't understand things. Why are things happening like that? But not in despair. I know that God has His plan, and so I'm not in despair. I don't have to be in despair. I don't have to uh, give up. And then persecuted but not forsaken. There are persecution in different parts of the world. This picture is persecution in one country. And we're persecuted but not forsaken. God will not forsake us. And now many people say, well, Christians in persecution, they, it's like they're left alone, it's terrible. But God is with them. So when we are persecuted, we we'll trust in God all the time. We praise God all the time and we have the presence of God. God is helping me. God is blessing me. God is with me. And then we will have strength and we'll experience His presence. For people who are experiencing uh, persecution, Jesus has promised us that. You don't have to prepare ahead of time what to say, how to answer the people who persecute you. Because at that time, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. So here is a promise that the Holy Spirit will, will be with us to tell us what to say. If He tells us what to say, He will also tell us what to do, how to avoid danger, how to be strengthened, how to have food. So He will guide us. So I hope that we all believe that even in the midst of persecution, we know that God is in control. Now I'm prepared for persecution. I know it's not easy when persecution comes. But I always believe that, that God will be with us. And so I believe that when I'm being persecuted, I will trust in God, I will have a close relationship with God, I will listen to God and let God guide me and not be discouraged and not uh, give up. So I hope we all have this heart to be prepared for persecution. And then always caring about in the body, in our body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Always caring the death of Jesus Christ. I'm dying with Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body so that we carry His life, His strength, His joy, His peace. Every good thing from Jesus is showing in our life. So it's very important when ministers are persecuted or ridiculed or people give pressure that we don't give up and then we try to find ways to handle uh, uh, the problems, okay? So we finish here about uh, the qualities of people who serve God. I talked about that last time. This is just the last part. And now I'm going to go through these questions. Now when we go through these questions, I hope we all think, when we see this question, we all think how to answer these questions. That we want to uh, be able to answer this question and be able to teach it ourselves. I hope you don't just come here and listen and listen. Okay, I've learned it. No, we cannot just learn by listening. We have to memorize it, apply it, understand it, and then be able to, to teach it. So I'm going to send you the document that has these questions and has also the PowerPoint. I will send you the PowerPoint and the documents then you can see the questions and then see if you can answer the questions. And those who can answer the questions well, then I will give you certificates. I hope people won't give up. Let me tell you, my teaching 
here is very critical because it will help people to really be ready to serve God. It will help people to serve God. It will strengthen people. It will give them strength and direction to serve God. Uh, people will have strength from the Lord and will not lose hope when they follow these teachings. It's not my teaching, it's God's teaching. So I hope we all take this seriously, that we would want to say, I want to memorize it, I want to be able to teach it. So try to remember this, uh, this teachings and also try to be able to answer the questions. Okay, now, um, so we go through this again, and then, but now it's the questions. The first part, essential qualities of people who serve God, relationship with God, so the first part. 